is that really um, you need to understand yourself. It wouldn't matter if you were given three years to a deadline. You would instantly write it down, put it in a book, and then forget about it. And with a week or three weeks to go, you go, oh my God, it's a deadline. And she's absolutely right. And I can now tell you, since the book is published, that this book was handled in exactly the same way. When Mercier Press said, we'd love to publish your book, I said, brilliant, why don't we do this book? Sent it off to them, and they said, movie done, does it? And I promptly compartmentalised it and forgot all about it. And then they came back and said, just checking that you're on track for the book, everything's okay. And I thought, okay, it's either due at the beginning of next month or the end of next month, I'm not sure which. Had a look with the end of next month, came back and said, sure, we're on track, not a bother, we'll have it in on time. And then had a look at what did I tell them I would actually say in the book. And in the book, I looked at it and it said, there are 10 red hot tips, so a chapter on each of the tips, and I talked to a company each time and get their take on how they apply the tips. And I thought, well, that's really clever. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. So I sent it off to them, wrote the book, sent it off, and then Mercier came back and said, OK, what you need to do now is just check these particular sentences, make sure you've used exactly the right verb, this has exactly the right meaning. So I did exactly what they asked me to do. I went in and chose those sentences on those pages and went, the other right, that, that verb needs to change, and sent back to them again. And then they came back and said, OK, this is the final, final version of the book. Now, please make sure we read it from start to finish and make sure you're happy with every word in it. So I said, OK, I'll block out some time. And I read the entire book from start to finish. And having read it, I can tell you, it's a great little read. <laughs> <laughs> I surprised myself. <laughs> Actually, one of the things that you forget when you're in business is I, I wrote the book for small to medium-sized enterprises. And I really wrote it because when people think about public relations, they think about bringing in a public relations consultant, retaining them to do a job for you. They think about spending a lot of money. But there's an awful lot of small businesses that need PR who don't have a budget to spend on it. And really the idea behind this book was I can teach you the tricks, I can tell you how you do it, but what you need is the time to apply it. But at least if you have the time and the willingness, you can learn to apply it. And the reason I wanted to talk to each of the different companies was so that you'd actually have a live example of how one company had taken this particular tip and applied it so that you would see how you could use it yourself. While I was going through each of the different companies, let me give you a sort of a feel for the, the 10 tips that I came up with and the companies that I was lucky enough to talk to. Entertainment opportunities. People often don't think of entertainment as part of public relations, and yet if you can combine a good entertainment opportunity that brings all of your clients together, it makes a huge amount of sense. And the example that I used in the book was Brown Thomas and the ISPCC. Brown Thomas obviously has quite a wealthy base of clients. They obviously want to bring them in every year and tell them these are the new fashions, this is what we're doing now. We'd like to show you the kind of things that you can spend your money on, which makes a huge amount of sense. And the ISPCC is always looking to raise money for the, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. So the combination of the two was very clever because you now get to go to, and the, the function is sold out every year, the tables are booked a year in advance, it's a corporate entertainment event to die for if you were organising it from scratch yourself. And the whole idea is that uh, the Brown Thomas get to bring in the people they want to bring in, show them all of the fashions, encourage them to spend on it, and at the same time, give them a reason to feel that they have actually contributed to a worthy cause. They've done something good by being ladies who lunch. Very, very clever. Um, e-zines and newsletters, uh, second red hot tip in the book. I'm a great believer that the easiest way to get in front of people is to land into their inbox. So if it comes into your email box, at least you have an opportunity to say, I'm interested, I'm not interested, but you have to read the subject line. So it reminds everybody that you're around there, and it doesn't take a huge amount of time to do it. And the example, you won't be surprised, that we used for this one was the Irish Academy of Public Relations. Well, I have to put the Academy in there somewhere, okay? Um, I also looked at exhibitions, and exhibitions, if you think about exhibitions, if you decide to participate in an exhibition, somebody else is bringing the audience in for you. Somebody else has said, I will gather together everybody who has an interest in this area. You take a stand and you sell to them because they're there already. And I met a company called High Rock Productions. I met them at an exhibition last year which was targeting transition year students. And these two guys were brilliant. They used not only their own space, but they used the space that was directly in front of their stand. So they took over this entire section. And they took it over with a game of virtual tennis. 
So when I was walking past, they went, excuse me, excuse me, stand there, please. Big room for the court. And they had all these kids there going, and don't ask me, sir, or whatever you do in tennis. But everybody actually stood back and went, amazing, great idea. So when I interviewed the two guys, I said, you have to tell me um, what worked and what didn't work. And they were very honest about what didn't work with the exhibition as well. And I said to them, I, I really loved what you did. Very clever way to use the exhibition. I'm going to use it in the book. And Neil and his brother both run the business. And Neil said, at the end of it all, God, just imagine, said, we are both very well-known actors. Like we, we act in everything Oscar that happens in the country. And we are probably going to go down in history for being in a bloody PR book. <laughs> and I hope at least they appreciate what I have done for them. I've made them in the <laughs> If you look at something like social media, uh, one of the things that people will tell you about social media is they spend an awful lot of time on it. It takes an awful lot of time, and you're never really sure what you get back. I interviewed Jack Murray from Media HQ. Anybody in PR will know Jack Murray because he, he has cornered the market in media services to public relations companies. And you go into Jack Murray's office and he literally has every single wall is covered with what did we tweet, what's on Facebook, how many people liked it, what kind of interaction did we get, is it working, if it isn't, dump it, do the next thing. And he really is, he's a lesson in how to use social media cleverly. If you target the right people, if you're sending out the right messages to them, then are you actually checking it to make sure they're getting the message? And if they're not, move on, dump it, and do something different. Um, I also looked at press releases, and press releases are, I suppose, the most basic tool of public relations in a public relations kit. It's how do you write a story for media and send it to newspapers or magazines, be it online or offline. And when I was looking at press releases, I reckon that anybody can learn how to write a press release. It's quite simple. The problem is most people can't identify a really good story. So they can't find a good angle. They think everything they do is interesting, which we all do. But in fairness, if you stand back from it and read it and think, would I really be interested in reading that in a newspaper? Nine times out of ten, the answer is no. But I interviewed Kevin Doyle <coughs> from the Irish Independent and said to him, he's now their group political editor, and said, in terms of press releases, the good, the bad, the ugly, what's the advice? And I actually ended up saying to him, well, what about people who know you? Does it make a difference? Because smaller companies will always tell you, if you don't have somebody who knows the journalist, they're not going to cover the story for you. And he said, doesn't matter a whit. What matters is, is the story good? What we're looking for is stories that our readers are interested in. If you send that story written in the right format, and I have no extra work to do, I'm happy out. I've done my job. So press releases, still in there. Photographs, also still in there. I spoke with Jackie Marsh from Butler's Pantry. They're amazing. She actually does what she calls trialling for photographs. And she will draw out what she wants in a photograph first. Then they do about eight different run-throughs. I hope, Joe, Joe, you're paying attention to this. They do about eight different run-throughs. And then they bring in a photographer and say, this is what we have decided we want to do. And signs on that some of the photographs are still being used five years after they first took them. So they get great value out of them. I also look to press receptions. The press receptions that everybody loves to go to. We can all air kiss, drink wine, call everybody darling and have fun. <laughs> and preferably turn up in a newspaper at the end of it all. And I interviewed John Marr from the Irish Independent. He does a huge amount of press receptions for the music industry. And he was fascinating. He was like the grumpy old man in the book. He won't mind me saying that. But I started by saying to press receptions, you're all press receptions. They're not what they used to be. And I was okay, what did they used to be like? And actually it was very interesting because he said, the way press receptions have now changed has become all about the goodie bag and tweeting and what do you get in advance. And people are actually forgetting that it's a press reception for the press. And you're supposed to tell them all kinds of things. That's the primary purpose. But he was also very interesting about the expectations that people had coming out of press receptions. That very often people have very unreal expectations of the kind of publicity they're likely to get. I also looked at sponsorship and corporate social responsibility, CSR. And the company I spoke with was Paul Fagan from Action Coach. Paul Fagan owns the master franchise for Action Coach in Ireland. And he actually went to hear a chat by Philly McMahon, the Dublin footballer, he was being awarded something or other. And Paul sat and listened to him, and Philly talked about growing up in Ballymun, the expectation that you had, either in terms of education or the business that you would go into or your life expectancy, and he was really moved by it. And he came back to his own team and said, we're in coaching. 
So why don't we do something with coaching for people in Ballymun? And what they did was, and they now do, is they go into the schools and they coach people in business skills. So they teach them, they develop this board game, and the board game teaches you how to make a profit, how to negotiate, how to read a balance sheet. It's the kind of thing that nobody in their right mind would invent. But they invented it, and apparently it's going down a treat. But it's a great idea because it means that students will now say, actually I have an ability, or I have a, a natural niche in that area that I might never have otherwise identified. We looked at conferences and seminars, and Seamus McCann from IFI Global was the man I spoke to. And Seamus actually went to, when, when you think of conferences and seminars, most companies think of two things. Either you're offering a speaker for a conference and seminar, or putting your branding onto it. So sponsor it. Come in, put the money on top of it, you'll be grand. Your name is associated with it. He was completely different. What he decided he would do was, he would, he attended a conference in France, which was about international funding, he thought, brilliant idea, we need to do that in Ireland, but rather than wait for somebody else to do it, I'll actually create the entire conference. So he created the conference, which now is branded by IFI Global, his company. And actually, if you're in the international financial space, they've become the go-to company. And he did it simply by being the first person to introduce the conference in Ireland. So it was very, very clever. And the final idea, the final hot tip, um, well, the penultimate, Third-party endorsers, what I call third-party endorsers, what Newbridge Silver would call ambassadors. You know if you go for a meal, you, stop, you put your foot into a restaurant and you say to somebody, is this a good restaurant, what are they going to say to you? It's a fabulous restaurant, we have a great chef, we have brilliant service, you love eating here, please sit down and spend your money, we'll serve you well. And you say, yeah, well, they would, wouldn't they? You know, what do you expect, like it's their restaurant, of course they're going to say that. Somebody stops you later on this evening and says, have you eaten in such and such a place? It's amazing. I was there the other night. The service is marvellous. That's a third party endorser. That's somebody who says, I have no axe to grind with this at all. I just think they were brilliant. You should go. And Newbridge, I think, have it down to a fine art with third party endorsers, both living and dead. Uh, the dead, obviously, in the museum that they have of style icons so that they're associated with people who seem to be part of Newbridge Silver, even though they never knew Newbridge Silver existed. And the living, because they use people like Amy Huberman and Naomi Campbell and Keith Wood and Linda Gray from Dallas. And they're people that you look at and think, oh, well, if Newbridge Silver is good for them, it's good for me. What fascinated me when I spoke with Marie Brennan about Newbridge Silver, I said to her, so you had Amy Huberman? And she said, yeah. And I said, so how does that work? Because I presume that the rules are really strict. You may only wear Newbridge silver, or I will chop your legs off. You know, you are promoting our product. And she said, no, 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 no. What we do is we find people who like our product, and we say to them, we would love you to be an ambassador. Now, we know that you will wear other jewellery, because people do. They don't wear just from one designer. But when you feel like wearing Newbridge, wear Newbridge. It's entirely your call. And Amy Huberman, War Newbridge when she announced that she was expecting her second child. I have to read you this tweet, okay? Because you do know that she is the Twitter goddess, okay? So Amy tweeted, thanks for all the lovely messages. Hashtag OOTD quote by cause. Necklace by at Newbridge Silver. And bump by at Brian O'Driscoll. Yes. That photo went viral, absolutely viral. As a result of which Newbridge sold out of the necklace that she was wearing, they went to a second run and the second run sold out, even though it was larger than the first one they did. I can tell you confidently that I have just tweeted in the last few minutes that this is what I have tweeted. So retweet her thumbs at the ready, please. Thank you for all your lovely messages. Book by at Irish Publisher. Story about at Amy Hoberman, told by at Ellen Gunning, hashtag 10 red hot tips. <laughs> now I reckon if you all retweet that, <laughs> we can make this the fastest selling business book in Ireland. <laughs> and Mercier will be phoning me in the morning saying, you won't believe this, we have to go to a second print. So retweet please at will. <laughs> and you learn something new every day. Uh, there are a number of people that I have to thank. I have to thank my publicist, 
uh, Deirdre Roberts, I have to say that again because I have had so much pleasure saying that for the last year. My publicist, how many other people in the room can say that? I know, I'm insufferable. So my publicist, thank you. Um, she's actually been brilliant. She just took this book on board from minute one and said, there are a million and one things we can do with it and she has done absolutely everything with it. I must thank Natalie Connors, who is my American publicist, who is organizing the American launch. Don't you just love this? As I speak. Uh, there are two other Americans I must thank, Julia Lecayo from California and Clara Warner from Texas, who worked, both worked with us over the summer up period, and they were just so excitable and so into everything you did, and they just took the whole book and went, I love it, what can we do for it? They were marvellous. Um, my own team who are here this evening, I must thank Neil Rochford and Jeremy Papan have both been looking after the video all evening. Claire Nolan, where is Claire? Claire is Snapchatting and tweeting for Ireland. And Donald Hurley, where's Donald? Hello. Is making sure that Joe photographs absolutely everybody. Who is. If you haven't been photographed, Donald has red hair and a beard. He's responsible for you not being in a picture so far. Have the words, okay? I must thank my husband Tony for living with me. Because I wouldn't do it. Uh, and for your constant support. Every time I come up with a daft idea, Tony's the one person I can be sure will stand there and go, Actually, you probably decided you're doing it anyway. <laughs> and says, right, go for it. Um, I must thank Hodges Figgis, actually, to be very fair to them. Hodges Figgis have been great since my first book came out in 2003. Hodges Figgis have been really, really good supporters. So it really is a thrill to launch in my favourite bookstore and probably the premier bookstore in Ireland. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, three other people who did reviews of the book, I have to thank. AJ Noonan, the chairman of the Small Firms Association here in Dublin, gave it a great review. Um, Maureen Pace, the president of the World Trade Center in Boston, and Nidal Abu Zaki, the chief executive of Orient Planet PR in Dubai, um, all gave up their time and did fabulous little videos saying what the book was about and what it meant to them. It was brilliant. Um, I should thank you all for coming, because uh, it really is difficult. I know from teaching event management that they say the most difficult thing to do is actually get people to come out on a night. The people will say, oh yeah, I have 101 reasons why I shouldn't do it. And particularly in the middle of a bus strike, that really shows commitment, so thank you, mucho, mucho gracias. Um, don't forget Twitter, uh, retweet Amy Huberman, will you, for God's sake. Um, but follow me on Twitter to keep up to date with whatever we're doing with the Academy or with PR or with whatever, with the next book. I haven't told my publicist about that yet. <laughs> and finally, whatever you do to keep her happy, don't leave without buying a copy of the book. Thank you very much for this evening. If you'd like to see some more videos, subscribe to the channel, okay? Don't forget to see loads more videos here, and you can join us on Facebook, Twitter, or the website, ellengunning.com. Keep in touch.